how goodly and how pleasant it is when brethren are all sitting together, davening as one, calling out to Hashem as one, especially on the fast day of Shivansar Vitamuz, as we begin the period known as the Bain HaMitzarim, where we have to learn how to rectify all the causes of the destruction of the Beis HaMikdash. Bilam said, Hein am levadad yishkon, that we are a nation that dwells alone, which means that if we don't stick together, no, one's gonna be there, no one else will be there for us. And therefore, it's truly wonderful when we can come together as a community and simply show achtus and communal care and love for each other. It is therefore a tremendous honor to be able to welcome all of the, uh, many of the various different shuls in the area. We hope in the future to be able to incorporate even more achdus for the future. It gives me a tremendous honor to be able to welcome Harav Michalowicz from the West Mount Shul to give us a few words at this time. I'm almost tempted to say good Shabbos, but uh, whatever we're going to say, the main thing is to say that I'll be done in exactly 11 minutes when I'm told to stop. I think I'm fortunate to be able to speak today, if I'm not mistaken, amongst the Rabbanim at the Dais, I've been in Thornhill longer than any of them. 25 years ago when I moved to Thornhill, there were two shuls in the area and a very small community. Baruch Hashem, over the last 25 years, uh, I recognize many of the faces were all a little bit grayer and a little bit uh, older, Baruch Hashem. A lot has changed. Many more shuls in the area, many more sub-communities in Thornhill. And the question is, has this growth in any way impacted on the unity of Thornhill or not? That's what we're here for. And the answer is, we first have to have a practical understanding of what unity means. What does achdus really mean? And perhaps to understand what the opposite of achdus means. What's the opposite of unity, if not machlokes? And is machlokes something that is good or is it something that is bad? So if you look in Perkei Avos, you're not sure exactly. The Mishnah says in Perkei Avos, what is a machlokas l'shem shemaim? A machlokas is l'shem shemaim will endure. A machlokas that is not l'shem shemaim will not endure. A machlokas hilum shamay will endure. A machlokas of Kurach and his foes will not endure. It seems from the Mishnah that they definitely can have machlokas that is good. Hilum shamay was a machlokas that should be miskayim. So indeed, there is something wonderful about machlokas and somehow that's not supposed to be in contradiction to what unity is all about. And through the limited time, I'll give you one simple muscle. I hope it'll be enough. If you look <clears throat> at your own body, would you say there's unity in your body or machlokas in your body? You've got a right hand that does things very different than the left hand. We do everything the opposite the way the left hand does it. The right foot, the left foot, every different body part is uniquely, uniquely different. It's a different chalek. Is totally different, has a different function than the other part. Is there enmity between these parts? Does the right hand get upset if the left hand gets to shake someone's hand in shul? If he's a lefty, he always complains, you always get to shake people's hands in shul. Probably not. Why? Because they all serve a common, higher purpose, which is what we'll call the eye of the human being. To understand that there is a greater purpose than my particular parochial need of being the right hand or the left foot. And indeed, that's a classic example where there is tremendous machlokes, because each one is going to do things very different than the others. But if they understand that we have a higher purpose than my own particular need, and sometimes if the need is to lie down and to keep the right hand and left hand quiet, we'll be quiet so we can get a good night's sleep. And other times the right hand will get its opportunity. That's really what this is all about. Hashem has created an amazing tapestry of all kinds of amazing machlokas from the second day of creation. That's the way Hashem wants it to be. With lots of different flavors. But it all depends on one thing. Where are the flavors focused? Where are all these unique individuals focused? If we're all focused for a higher eye, which is the Rabbeinu Shalom, then you can never be jealous of another part of Klal Yisrael that's doing their own thing. You can sense this when you see great events happening. You go to Meron and Lagba Omer, you'll see dozens of different stripes of Yiddishkeit. 
but nobody really is interested in seeing any of the differences between anybody because they're there for the one thing, for the holy Rosh B. Even Meron loses its title of Meron almost. It gets swallowed up in all of Klal Yisrael. So therefore, when we look at Machlokas and we look at differences and we look in a Thornhill community that has grown and there's so many different flavors, there may be a lot of Machlokas in terms of different flavors that we have in different ways to be Jews. Is there Achtus that all depends? Everyone has to answer the question for themselves. Every Kehillah has to answer the question for themselves. Is what everything we do for the sake of the common higher cause for all of us? And if what if one shul would hear that another shul was almost falling apart? Would they silently say, let it fall? Or would they say, no, we have to raise funds so the other shul would be able to survive because they offer something maybe we don't offer? should never come to that. But that would really be a test to see if there would be Achtus in this world. So the point is that Achtus, Achtus comes to the Echad, and there's only one Echad in this world. It's the Rabbi Nishal Island. He's the only Echad. And if whatever we do, we always are thinking that it is for that Echad. And although many of us approach our observance in different ways, some people are into davening, more people into learning, others into chesed, how we dress, we have to honestly ask ourselves, if everything I am doing is for the Rabbi Nishalalim, then I am one part of tens of thousands of Jews who are a beautiful chemistry of one body, Selim Elohim, that is serving Hashem. Baruch Hashem, we have a Hillel and a Shammai. Without Hillel, we would never know what Chesed really is. Without a Shammai, we wouldn't know what Emes is. And a Jew who relates to Hashem more with Chesed, is Baruch Hashem, he's got a Hillel. Jew who relates to Hashem more in terms of MS, Baruch Hashem, there's a Shammai. Hashem made Jews so different, and they need different communities. They need different types of Hashpa, because there are 70 faces to the Torah. We can't expect everyone to be in one face. So the question then is, is how can we determine if we are exactly L'Shem Shemaim? How can we prove if we are L'Shem Shemaim? You ask everyone, of course I'm L'Shem Shemaim. What's the doubt? And over the years I feel the one acid test of you are L'Shem Shemaim is very simple. How many Shilas do you ask from your Rav? That will determine if you are really L'Shem Shemaim. Because when you have a Shilas, Shilas means I'm not sure what to do. And we do have our own druthers. There's a lot of things we would prefer to do. And if you say, well, I don't know, I don't have to really ask the question, I pretty much know what to do, knowing that you have a bias, knowing that you have people that are much older, wiser, and experienced to perhaps show you an answer that you may not be wanting to hear, then how the shame Shemaim are you when you're not asking Shilas when perhaps you should be asking Shilas? As a matter of fact, isn't that what Shivasa Bratamas is all about? How did we get into all this trouble in Shivasa Bratamas? Moshe didn't come down. Do you think it would have been a good opportunity to ask Aaron a Shiloh maybe? Instead, what did he go to Aaron? They asked him a Shiloh. They said, Aaron, now that we've decided not to wait for Aaron, Moshe, and now that we've decided that we're going to worship an idol, Aaron, we're asking a Shiloh, which idol should it be? And Hashem, when he saw that, he said, you know what, if you don't have to ask any Shilohs, or you fashion the Shiloh way you want the direction of it to go, that means you're not yet understanding there's a larger purpose here that you're all united for. And there's no way you're ever going to get to Eretz Yisrael. That's the Shirish. That's the Shirish of the problem. And it's not because of the, of the egos that the Rabbanim have who stand up front. They're plenty busy people. But the question is, how important is it for each and every one of us to know what is the Ratzon Hashem? When you serve as a Jew, is the Ratz and Hashem the first thing on your agenda? Or is it everything that I plan on getting in life from what the materialistic world has taught me, what I have bought into, I will try to squeeze my Yiddishkeit in through the Shilas that I'm comfortable asking. There's all kinds of people who ask Shilas. There's some who don't ask any Shilas. We're not talking to them. Maybe we are. Those who ask every Shilas. And there are those I found over the years that they will only ask a Shiloh in the realm of their comfort zone. Something that, you know, sometimes somebody calls me and says, Rabbi, something happened with the chulam pot, you know, is it, is it okay? And I said, it's okay. So they said, you know, I thought so. 
But I just wanted to check. And I say to myself, of course you thought so. That's the only reason you called me. <laughs> but how about to ask those questions that really get into your personal life? The questions that are really important. You're going to have people who will ask the, many of these simple questions. Is the, is the pot trafe? Is the kosher? You know why? Because I'm wealthy enough. If I blow $15 on a shilas, it's worth it for the rabbi to think I'm a very pious Jew that I ask lots of shilas. But then when it comes to maybe other questions about perhaps what school you should send your child to, knowing you have every child is unique and every school is unique, and where will he get the best year of Shemayim? Do you ask your rabbanim shilas like that? Do you ask Shilas of Arav if you should be able to daven in a shtibel in a Friday night? There are Shilas that are involved. Believe it or not, it may be a Shila. You might think it's unity. There's an Indian of davening in a base Nessus. Did you bother to ask the question if you should go or even, even to open up one? Did you bother to ask the Shila if you're permitted to attend the Kiddush Club or not? Well, on the one hand, it seems to promote a lot of access. On the other hand, it detracts from what's going on in the shul. Did you ask a Shiloh? Did you ask a Shiloh to have to pay people their wages on time even though they didn't do such a good job? Did you ask a Shiloh how much money should you spend on a Simcha? Did you ask a Shiloh if I should make up with my relatives? Did you ask a Shiloh if I have to put a filter on my internet or not? Or even if you ask a Shiloh can I listen to music on a radio during the three weeks? So all questions that we're very uncomfortable asking. If you're asking those questions constantly that says loud and clear, I'm a hand, I'm a foot of a bigger, bigger conglomerate that's bigger than me, that's more important than me, and I'm prepared to take the answer, even if it's going to cause inconvenience in my life, because the only thing I want is Ratz Hashem. If we don't, then what are we saying? Yiddishkeit is to my convenience. And if you have 10,000 Jews who have Yiddishkeit for their convenience, there's no way they're going to be united. You can sit 500 people in a room and they may cosmetically look united, but if we don't hear 500 Shilas in the next three weeks, that will tell the truth about what unity is. Let me f- close with this Shiloh that was never asked. And if you don't want to ask a Shiloh, this is the Shiloh you don't have to ask. I'll say the story very quickly. with Rebbe Hanan Wasserman and his Rebbetson. Rebbe Hanan Wasserman, you know, married the daughter of Mayor Atlas. Khanan was learning in the Rush, he was Rashiv Baranovich. Mayor Atlas passed away, he was a Rav of Salant. The wife very much wanted him to take the Stella in Salant because he could be with his widowed mother. She could be with his widowed mother. So he, oh, she says to, uh, to, uh, to Rabbi Khanan, maybe we should try the Stella in Salant. And as a matter of fact, Salant had offered him the job. He says, no, no, I'm not going to be interested in that job. I already was offered in Moscow, I don't want it. I'm an instant Rabbi Khanan, I'm an instant the headaches. I love to teach Torah, I want to be a Russian Baranovich. They were under terrible poverty. It was incredibly difficult. He could go to Salon, he'd have a decent parnasa, be with the mother-in-law. It would be amazing. But he says, I don't want to do this. So the Rebbe said, I know what we'll do. We'll ask your Rebbe. You're the Talmud Muvak of the Chavetz Chaim. We'll ask him. And he'll tell you what to do. And then we'll know what to do. Now, Rolchanan is mixed feelings over here. Because he knows he has to ask his Rav. And he knows what his Rav is going to answer him. And he knows he's going to alter his life forever. He says, fine, you can go and ask the Shila. So the next morning, the Rebbetson takes her bag. She goes to the, to the, to the wagon driver. who's going to take her to the train station. Rochanan is standing by the door. The Rebbetson getting the guy to put the baggage there. And the Rebbetson is about to get out of the bag. She takes one look at Rebbechanan. And she sees Rebbechanan tears going down his cheek because he knows what the answer is going to be if she asks the Chavetz Chaim. And she turns to the wagon driver and says, Sorry, I changed my mind. I'm not going. I'm going to go back. I don't need you. I'll pay you for your time. And that's all. She walked into the house. They never discussed the issue again. But Bukhanan was willing to have the Shiloh be asked, knowing that everything he wanted in life could be taken away. But the Rebbetson loved him so dearly, she didn't, would never ask the question to hurt her husband so badly. So there's a Shiloh you don't ask. That's the Shiloh you shouldn't ask. The Medrash says that Klal your soul is going to be redeemed only when we're a unified group. I think the Pshat is when Eliyahu and will come to answer all those Shilas. I think that is what all about. The Tekus are waiting for Eliyahu to answer all the questions. For who? For all those who with all those Shilas. With all those Shilas that want to know the Ratz Hashem, Eliyahu will come back and say the Ratz Hashem 
from all the shilas that were answered, ruling the Mashiach. We hope that in these three weeks, that the Rabbanim was so inundated with shilas, because that really says to us that we care. It says to us that I only want to do what Hashem wants. And if hundreds of people only want to do what Hashem wants, then for sure Hashem wants us all to get along with each other as well. Should be zeichel to that and the Mashiach from here remain amen. Thank you for listening.